Yeah, so I had a sister ask me, can you lose salvation? Chaldean Assyrian got so excited. He quotes Hebrews 10, 26 to prove you can. Don't you love that? My fellow Chaldean Assyrian quotes a passage that he believes supports that a person who's saved can lose their salvation, but he's not aware that there are Christians who are aware of these passages and have addressed them contextually, right? Anyway, sorry. You get what I'm saying? My, my shoulders are so narrow now. We were sailing along on a moonlight bay. No muscles, baby. No muscles. Not yet, anyway. Okay, folks, are you guys in the saddle? You guys ready? You guys ready? By the grace and mercy of the triune God, by the grace of the Father, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Yeah, let me show you. Let's see. Let's see. Does it show? Come on. I haven't been in the gym in a while. That's why there's no, it's, there's no, it's not ripped, baby. It's not ripped because I got to settle. I've noticed this is more round than here, this one, but it's because I haven't been in the gym yet. I mean, when I have, say I haven't been in gym, I haven't hit weights. I've been doing cardio. Lord Jesus willing, February is a beginning of a new chapter in my life. I settle in my place, get planted, and then I can focus. Someone asked me, someone asked me, why don't, what, do I plan on writing books? Okay, let me, let me answer that question. If I was able to be fully supported, to do the ministry where I don't have to worry about uh, making sure my daughters are taken care of, making sure the bills are taken care of. And still I'm not out of the, the woods yet with this corrupt, wicked, evil legal system, this corrupt judge, this agent of the devil. Then by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I would have the freedom, the freedom just to focus on writing books and the freedom to have a schedule where <clears throat> you guys would know in advance the times I'd come on live, like YouTube session, instead of just hit and miss, you guys would have a schedule, God willing. And then to keep studying and keep writing and refuting attacks on the Christian faith. I'm not there yet. I'm not completely free from these satanic attacks that are trying to drain me financially. And I'm not fully funded and supported for ministry. And I've said this. The Lord Jesus doesn't need me. I need the Lord Jesus. And the only thing I ask the Lord Jesus is to guide me by his spirit to make sure my daughters are taken care of. And I'm not at the mercy of any man. If that means having to leave ministry and do something else, his will be done. His will be done. And I wanna, I'm going to sound like a broken record when I say this. Let me just say it again. The Lord Jesus doesn't need me. He doesn't need me in ministry. I need him. If the Lord wants to use me in ministry... He is worthy, and to be honest, my heart is in ministry. When the Lord called me to full-time ministry in 1999, it was doing the very thing you love to do. You know how some people, they hate what they do. They work, but they hate their job. I love serving Jesus Christ. I love just <clears throat> watching, reading objections and attacks on the faith, and then reading and watching various Christian perspectives and Asking the Holy Spirit to empower me, enable me, then to synthesize what I'm hearing and separate the wheat from the chaff, and then perfecting my ability to absorb this information and then recall it and then share it with the body of Christ and be used of the Spirit to build up the body of Christ because I'm constantly in the presence of Jesus. <clears throat> I'm constantly in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love what I do. If I was interested in making money, I'd find some, something else to do. You get my point? If you want to get rich, it's not ministry. You want to get rich, become a lawyer. You want to get rich, be a real estate agent. You want to be rich, become a doctor. You don't do it to become financially rich. You do it to become spiritually rich and store up treasures in heaven for the glory of Jesus Christ. And even that shouldn't be your motive. Your motive is not to get rewards from Jesus. Your motive in doing ministry and worshiping Jesus is because he's worthy. He deserves your praise. He deserves your love. He deserves your worship. He deserves that you give him your entire life and even die for him because he is the reason that we live and move and breathe and have our being. We exist for his glory and he doesn't need us, right? But he is so rich and beautiful 
that he still rewards you for doing the things <clears throat> that you are required to do and commanded to do, and it's your duty to do. Everyone with me there? You get what I'm trying to say? So would I love to write books? Of course I would. Do I have the leisure to write books now? No, I don't. I'm still not out of my trials. I still don't know what's going to happen because of that financial burden that I was telling you about. I still haven't. <clears throat> How do I say this? I don't know if the Lord Jesus and his mercy is going to turn the hearts of the appellate court in my favor to see how wicked and corrupt and evil that judge is, set me free, or I'm going to have to find other means to get out of this debt. I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And I can't focus on tomorrow because if I get so occupied on tomorrow, the worries and concerns will eat me up that will rob me of the present time. And <clears throat> I need to make the most of the present time to do all I can to glorify Jesus Christ, though I fail him <clears throat> and I serve him imperfectly because tomorrow is not promised, right? You get my point? Everyone with me there? Yoshua, it's a long story. If you haven't been following my, my videos, don't ask me. Go back and watch the previous sessions. You'll see. Joel, I hope, I hope the Lord Jesus doesn't need me and I don't deserve <clears throat> anything good from the Lord but judgment. And I mean this. If you really understand how infinitely holy and majestic and glorious God is and that we are nothing but maggots and worms that can't offer God anything, what can you offer the creator of life? Because everything you give to him is what he's given you out of his grace and mercy and love. But because he's a humble God and a gracious God and a meek God and a good God, he still rewards you for your meager efforts. That's what's so amazing about him and so beautiful about him. He's amazing, our God. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the only true God. Amazing, right? Amazing. So by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the grace and mercy and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the holy blood of the Lord Jesus washing us, purifying us, may this session glorify, glorify him in the power of the Holy Spirit and bless the internet connection to keep the connection strong in Jesus' name. And you, you know one thing that disturbs me? You got people in the comment section, wicked, evil dogs of the devil, agents of the devil who have to chime in and attack and mock. Like someone saying, wow, you're praying for the internet connection and for buffering? What a waste of prayer. You can spend <clears throat> time praying for something important. As if even a good internet connection is not a gift of God. You see how wicked and evil and filthy that person is. Anything and everything that <clears throat> helps you, that benefits you, is the grace of God. Even internet is the grace of God. Right? To be able to afford internet is the grace of God. You know that? Having good internet is the grace of God. Anything and everything that's beneficial, that helps you, that makes your life easier or more enjoyable, that's the grace and goodness of God. From internet, from internet connection, to a car, to your furniture, to your clothes, to your refrigerator, to your TV, all that benefits you is a grace of God, a gift of God. Because you could be living at a time there was no internet. We could have been born 100 years ago. No internet, no internet connection, no YouTube, no television, no anesthesia, right? No morphine. You with me there? But that shows you how wicked and evil and selfish and ungrateful we are that you would complain that you would complain that i'm asking god to bless the internet connection for his glory and look here talk about trials and thorns in your side you know the lord loves you when he allows a thorn in your side to keep you humble and the thorn in my side is right here act 17 apologetics and by the way i'm going to announce a live stream even though he doesn't announce to his youtube subscribers that sam shimun's live God willing, tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Hater Wood, Acts 17 Apologetics, Hater Wood, Vocab Malone, and myself will be doing a live stream. So you're in for a treat. Not only am I live streaming now, but tonight, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if the Lord Jesus wills, if the triune God wills, 
a live apologetic session with Hater Wood, guy I've been carrying all my life. That's why I have a bad back and I'm hunched over because that's a lot of weight to carry with Vocab Malone. Okay, so tune in. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. That's Canadian time. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills, on his <clears throat> YouTube channel, Act 17. It can be the most boring session in, in the world, and he still gets 1,100 viewers. He can be sitting there just looking at the screen with a face that even <clears throat> a grandmother would have a hard time loving. Even a grandmother would have a hard time loving that face. He can just look at the screen. Goes live, 1,100. And here we talk about meaty and weighty issues, and I can barely get 200. Tell me this world is not evil. This world is not unfair. Tell me it's not unfair. All right? Okay. Now, how's your Arabic with wild hide? But yet, how's your Assyrian? Let's begin and ask the Father to bless this session. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, please, for the glory of your Son, for the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus, your heart, bless this session. <clears throat> bless everyone. Bless the speaker, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Seal us by your Spirit. Perfect us by your Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Spirit. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding and holiness and, and love and compassion, mercy and from your Holy Spirit, Father. Everything good comes from you, comes from the Lord Jesus, comes from your spirit. Give us that which is good in your sight, pleasing in your sight, Father. And Father, please grant me clarity of thought. Loosen my tongue to speak truth for the glory of Jesus, for the praise of Jesus, the majesty of the Lord Jesus. Save me from error and stammering and confusion. Enable me to recall the passages for your glory, Father, and bless your people. Flood us. Flood them. Flood us, Father. Flood our loved ones, my daughters. Flood my daughters, Father, in your living waters, in your glorious presence. <clears throat> flood us in the holy blood of Jesus, purifying us, cleansing us in the blood of Jesus, Father, and crucify our flesh. Destroy the, the attacks of the enemy, distractions from the enemy, Father. And help me be a blessing to your people and not a curse, Father. And bless the internet connection for your glory, Father. Have your way. We trust you. We depend on you. We believe in you. We love you. We are in love with you, Father. In love with the Lord Jesus. In love with your Holy Spirit. And please, Holy Spirit, take over my mouth for the glory of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. I may have to get water. Okay, now, before I do that, thanks to my brother, Al D., who's listening live, a brother dear to my heart. He had sent me this clip. Tony Evans, this great man of God, this great servant of God, a pastor who has pastored the Church of Jesus Christ with great integrity. And may the Lord Jesus preserve him until his homecoming, home going to be with Jesus. He eulogized his wife. His wife passed away less than a week ago. And folks, have you have you recalled, do you remember, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you remember? I said, there is biblical support, biblical confirmation, that when you're about to die, when you are about to die, <clears throat> you know, good-looking honky, you know that name suits you because it's obvious you were born from a female dog. Send good-looking honky to the crap that he originates from. Right here. Sorry, guys. And then David would wonder why I treat these filthy dogs the way they deserve. These filthy, wicked demons. Right? Lord Jesus be glorified. Anyway, he was eulogizing his wife. And you remember I've said there's biblical confirmation for this phenomenon, which is a common phenomenon. It happens more often than you think. Where the veil of he heaven opens before you die. And you see loved ones, or you may even see angels, or even the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's God's way of making your transition easy for you, right? Yeah, that's why I was thinking, honky donkey, right? Now, here you're going to hear it from Tony Evans. Listen, listen to Tony Evans talking about his wife when she's about to die. Listen. Increasingly clear. 
Slowly but surely, the time of her departure was nearing. But simultaneous to the time of her departure were things taking place that were letting us know she was dealing with something outside of the Earth's realm. Listen. For example, she said to some who were gathered in the room, do you see my mother? You see her? She's right over there by the fireplace. You, do you see her? Why can't you see her? On another occasion, she said, my father. There's my father. And there was no one in the room physically. She was seeing something as the time of her departure got closer. A few days ago, Listen to this. she said, two days. Two days, Lois, two days ago. Two days. Two days, listen. Take me up. Take me up, two days, take me up. Two days. Listen. Two days, take me up. Two and a half days she was gone. Did you hear that? Do you see how God removed the veil so she saw the other side? And her parents, who are believers, devout Christians in love with Jesus, she saw her mother and her father before she died, and she knew she was going to enter heaven two days. She goes, two days, take me up. See, I'm getting chills. Two days, take me up. And two and a half days later, she died to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you have to listen to the entire session. It will move you to tears. What an amazing godly woman she was, how much she loved Jesus, and what an amazing woman of faith and a godly wife and a blessing to this man's ministry. Listen to it. Now I'm going to show you another clip. By the way, that's from the eight-minute mark. If you guys want to listen, eight-minute mark. Now, let me go to the 28-minute mark. I want you to listen to this. Listen to this carefully. You're going to get blown away. You don't walk out on Jesus. Don't walk out on Jesus no matter what happens. Listen. You keep the faith. Hallelujah. You stay with the Lord. See how real our God is. Now listen to this. Please listen. Paul says, I, I didn't give up. I, I, I kept when I wanted to give up, when I wanted to throw in the towel, when I got too tired, I kept the faith. I remember this was a little earlier on when we were doing chemo and radiation and we go every day for chemo. She said, I want to give my radiation. It's Tony Evans. The reason why it sounds familiar, it's Tony Evans. He's eulogizing his wife. His wife went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ not too long ago. And he's talking about her transition and how God made it so easy because she saw the other side. God assured her, you're going to enter glory. You're going to be more alive, pain-free in the presence of Jesus. So listen. The Asian guy, a gift. I said, well, what do you want to give him? She said, give me a gospel track so I can witness to him about Jesus. She's there trying to save a life, but wanting a track so she could tell the radiation technician about Jesus. Listen to what he's going to say. Don't you give up on the faith. Because when your time comes, you want to be able to hear heaven. Listen. Paul said, I kept the faith. I didn't walk away from my belief system just because being a Christian became hard. Or because trials come. Because difficulties are there. Then he comes to his final verse, verse 8. Watch here. Paul says, now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But not for me only, but for all those who love his appearing. Listen to this. Uh, bad New World now Order. Now there is here. laid up for me. Now laid up for me. A crown of glory. Before he left, he knew that there was going to be an award waiting. Award. Listen. 
last week or so, Sister Evans rung out in the room, award! She was screaming. Award, they're calling me for an award. They're calling me for an award. Did you she hear that? saying award, award, they're just waiting for the song. Did you catch that? There was anticipation. Do you see what she heard? Do you see what she heard? Before she died, she goes, award. They're waiting for the song. They're calling me to my award. The veil was removed. She saw the other side. She saw her mother and father who had deceased before her, alive in the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord, because they were believers. They taught her the faith, taught her to be a godly woman. And then she saw them beckoning her to her award. Come to your award. Come to your award. They're just waiting for the song. Okay? That's how real your Jesus, my Jesus is. That's how real your God, my God is. That's how real the Bible is. Our Jesus lives. He is alive. And when I told you that when you're about to die, the veil from heaven will be removed. You'll see glory because the Bible teaches this. So don't be shocked that everyday life confirms what the Bible says. You should expect, because the Bible is God's word. It can only tell you what is reality. Yep, Tony Evans, eulogizing his wife. You hear me there? Did you catch it? Now, let me give you the verses that confirm what you just heard. I don't base my faith on experience, because you can have a satanic experience, an experience of the devil to deceive you. I base my faith in the Word of God so that when I hear such stories, I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's to be expected because the Bible's God's Word, and it tells us what reality is like. Now, does the Bible confirm that there's a veil that is removed to the spiritual dimension called heaven, where now you can see heaven as you're about to enter? Absolutely. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Acts 7, 55 to 56, and we're going to open up to Q&A. Absolutely. Lord Jesus, be glorified. Guide this conversation. Anointed, save me from Aaron. Bless your people and fill us. Fill my daughters, my angels, with your love, Lord Jesus, your presence, Lord Jesus. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Read. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open. There you go. Heaven's opened. I saw heaven open. And when that veil was removed, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That's the first verse. Mark 1. Mark 1, verse 10. Mark 1, verse 10. I'll come back to that in a minute, Turb. Mark 1, verse 10. I mentioned that to you last time, I think, in the previous session. Watch here. Exactly. Thank you, Andrew. Now notice this. And straightway coming up out of the water, he, Jesus, when he came out of the water baptism, saw the heavens open, ripped apart. The word open literally means to like rent asunder, ripped open. And the spirit like a dove descending upon him. The second verse that shows you that heaven is a spiritual dimension and there's a door or a veil that opens up and you can see it. That's why Tony Evans' wife, was seeing her mother and father in the room and seeing heaven calling her to a ward, but it was in the room. And if you look where she was looking, all you saw was walls in the ceiling because heaven is not part of the physical space. It's not out there. Heaven is another dimension that exists side by side with the physical realm. So imagine here my hands, heaven here, this is the physical realm. Right? And you have that veil between them. The veil removes, you can see heaven, and heaven sees you. You hear me there? Let me give you another example Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. Before we go there, one second. Oh, I got to do something. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 2. 
The Spirit transports John into heaven. But notice, before he goes to heaven, what does he see? Right? Okay. Hey, let's go there. Okay. Revelation 4, verse 1 and 2. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. A door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. Come up. Two days. Take... Take up. Two days, take up. That's what his wife said, right? Right? Come up hither, and I will show you uh, show thee things which must hereafter be hereafter. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by God's eternal, glorious, almighty Spirit, I was transported through that door, and I entered heaven. And behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Right? Yeah, don't worry about what these videos say, Zena. Just follow scripture, right? Now, let me give you another one. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16, but we're just going to look at the first two verses. Revelation 19, 11 to 16, but verse 11 and 12. Tony Evans, Jonathan. Tony Evans. Mike is his cousin. <laughs> just kidding. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. We're just going to read 11 to 12, though. And I saw heaven open. This is now the fourth example I gave you, that heaven is a dimension, the veil is removed, Heaven is opened up, a door opens, and you see the other side. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Okay, now I'll give you a final one. The fifth example. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Isaiah 64, verse 1. So let me give you the link. To that YouTube page, uh, to that YouTube uh, discussion. Anyway, in Jesus' name. Mike Evans is his cousin. There it goes. Listen to it. You'll start crying how he praises his wife. Notice Isaiah 64 1. Notice what Isaiah is asking God to do. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens. Oh, that you would rip the heavens open. That thou wouldest come down. That the mountains might flow down at thy presence and face. Why is Isaiah saying, rent the heavens open and come down? Because by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, they were told and they even saw that heaven is not part of the physical universe. It's not up there. It's another dimension. Another dimension that exists side by side with the physical dimension. And then the veil of that dimension can be removed. The door can be opened and you can see heaven right next to you. That's why when she's in her hospital bed or wherever she was, Heaven was right in front of her. She's right there. There goes my mom. There goes my dad. Oh, they're telling me, come to your reward. Come up. But you're, you look, you're seeing the ceiling. Right? Is that clear? So here's another confession, another testimony, another confession, another testimony of a godly man, a godly pastor who's been pastoring the church with integrity and a godly wife who entered glory. And they saw the other side before she died. Right? So just let me remind you that you're not simply reading make-believe, myth about a fictional character. You're reading the book that is the word of the true God who is real, who is alive, and that Jesus truly lives. And this is his word. And by trusting in him and trusting his word, you too We'll see heaven open and enter his presence and enter into your everlasting rest. No more pain, no more suffering, no more death, but being flooded in the infinite love, mercy, compassion, joy, and peace of the Lord Jesus as you see him in his glorified physical body standing before you. That's what you're going to see. Okay? That's what you're going to see. Now, before I begin, I'm going to give you some links to some articles, okay? Some links to some articles, and we're going to begin the Q&A, okay, before I do that here. Some of the questions I was asked, folks, believe me when I tell you, you ask me questions, you ask me questions, I've not only answered over the years in these sessions, I have articles addressing these questions. I was asked about Mark 13, 32, Jesus not knowing the day or hour, and I'll answer that again. And whether that means the Holy Spirit doesn't know, because Jesus says, of the dear hour, no one knows, 
neither the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father alone. alone. So if no one knows, doesn't that mean the Holy Spirit doesn't know? When I tell you, go to the website, answeringislam.net, answeringislam.net. Look for individual authors, Sam Shimon. Or go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. And you'll find your answers there. I'm not lying. I promise you. Since 1999, when the Lord Jesus called me into full-time ministry, ministry, I have devoted myself by the grace of God's spirit to answer all of these objections. Answer all of these objections. And here, my article on the Holy Spirit, whether he's omniscient. So here's the link. Save it. I answered this question years ago because a Muslim raised it. Doesn't Mark 13, 32 prove that the Holy Spirit is not omniscient? No, it doesn't. So here is that article answering that. And I'll answer it here. And here's another article. It's a response. It's a multi-part response to a Mohammedan on Mark 13, 32. Two-part response refuting his assertion that Jesus can't be God because he doesn't know everything. So here's part one. Let me get you the link to part two. So, folks, you do yourself a disservice if you're not going to the website, answeringislam.net, clicking on individual authors, looking for me, Sam Shimon, or even Anthony Rogers. Over 90% of my articles and rebuttals answer the toughest objections against the Trinity, against Jesus Christ's deity, and against the Bible. Over 90% of my material is focused on defending the core doctrines of the Christian faith by the grace of God. It's there. Answering us on blog.wordpress.com. Do a search. It's there. Study the material. Learn the arguments. Absorb them. Pass them on to others. Let me get you the link to part two. Hold on. Well, where is part two? Sorry. I guess I'm in the end notes. All righty then. Hold on. Should be a link, but I guess I didn't link to it. It's all right. Oh, yeah, it is. Here it goes. Okay. And I'm going to give you links to some new articles I just posted, and we're going to begin. We're going to begin. Pray. We get about 200 today, man. Just blessing to get 200. We went down. Here you go. This is part two. Save these. Now let me get you some articles from my blog that I just posted. And then we begin. Not only answering questions. There are a couple of questions that already came up. Answering this law, that's why. So we're going to answer those. Lord willing. And I've, I've noticed that most of your questions are directly, re directly related to... The Trinity again, you see? This often comes up. But hold on, let me get you these two articles. Save the links. I'll try to put them in the description box, Lord Jesus willing. And then we begin because there's three questions right off the bat for me to answer. Three questions. God willing, I'll get into them in a minute. Let me just get the links. Hope that testimony encouraged you. Here's a new post on Jesus being Thomas's Lord and God. I just posted this yesterday. No, two days ago. I just posted this two days ago. Jesus being Thomas is Lord and God and how this proves that Jesus must be Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. So here's the link. I just posted the link three times. Jesus, Thomas is Lord and God. How John 20, 28 proves that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. Okay. Oh, my neck. All right. That's one. And one related to Islam. Here's the one related to Islam. I need a good chiropractor. Got chiropractor. Here is another post that I also published two days ago. The incomplete Quran revisited the story of Ishmael. I again prove that the Quran is a lie. It's full of contradictions. It cannot be the word of the true God because it claims to be a book that explains everything in detail. But in this article, I ask a series of questions about Ishmael that no Muslim can answer from the Quran alone. No Muslim can answer from the Quran alone, proving the Quran is a lie and Muhammad is a liar and an antichrist. So please save the links. Study the material. Did you get all the links? Can you get all the links? Yeah, when you say Yahweh and Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua is Yahweh. And using the Hebrew names for God doesn't make you any closer to the kingdom or more spiritual. Right. Just let you know. Some people think and I love you, Jamie. Jamie, I say that with love. Jamie Curry. I don't know if you're a sister or a brother. I love you. And I say this in love. Don't take it as an attack. Somehow people think that if you speak the languages of the revelation, that somehow means you're getting closer to God. You're more spiritual. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. 
If knowing Hebrew was a prerequisite to being more spiritual or more endued with wisdom from the spirit, right? Then what do you do with the fact that the books of the New Testament were written in Koine Greek, not in Hebrew? You get my point? The reason why the Old Testament is in Hebrew and parts of Aramaic, because the people that God was communicating to spoke Hebrew. But when God wanted the message to spread all over the world to all nations, he had the authors in the New Testament write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the language spoken by the world at that time, Koine Greek. Benjamin, it's okay. I won't condemn you for joking. As long as you're not blasphemous, as long as you're not nasty. It's okay. Don't be scared. So what is the King James only joke? It's if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. If it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Right? I'm not saying that the original languages don't give you things in the text that you may not see in an English translation. That's a given. There are things in the original languages that don't come out in a translation. But when people who speak English tell me Yeshua or Yehovah, I know they mean well. I'm not imputing their, their intention. Only God knows the hearts and the intentions of the hearts. But you speak English. Why can't you say Jesus or Jehovah? The only reason why I'll say Yahweh or Yehovah, because Yahweh has been adopted into the English language. But I say Yehovah to emphasize the fact that there's strong evidence suggesting that the four consonants called the Tetragrammaton, which represent the divine name in the original language of the Old Testament, is actually more accurately pronounced as Yahovah, from which we get Jehovah. Right? Yeah, okay. So in the Greek, what's his name, Michael? What's his name in the Greek? When the New Testament was written in Greek under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What name did the Holy Spirit give him in Greek? Okay, Pastino, Fatuccino. What was Jesus' Greek name? Jesus. So, Michael, why would you tell me Yeshua is Jesus' name, Jesus is Jesus' name, and Jesus is Jesus' name? It depends on which language you speak. So when you tell me Yeshua is his name, that's in Hebrew. Yeshua is not his name in Greek. Yeshua is not his name in Latin. Yeshua is not his name in Swahili. You know what Jesus' name is in English? Jesus. You know what Jesus' name is in Greek? Jesus. So when you tell me Yeshua is his name, no, that's his name in Hebrew. What's his name in Greek, in Latin, in English, in Arabic, in Swahili? Come on, guys. Let's be serious. Right? Let's be serious. Okay? So just so I want you to understand, don't follow into this movement that's growing. Uh, Michael, the New Testament's written in Greek. If I have to explain it again, you know we're going to say bye-bye. Michael, Matthew 121, did the Holy Spirit have Matthew write in Greek or Hebrew? Michael, what language did the Holy Spirit have Matthew write, Matthew 121, in, in Greek? I just gave it to you, Greek, right? What is the Greek word that the Holy Spirit had, had Matthew record as being the name of the Savior? So don't tell me, well, that's his name. His name, yes, if it's in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. If it's Greek, it's Jesus. Don't make this more than it is, Michael. You're not going to get far, brother. Tread lightly, my brother. Tread lightly. You get what I'm saying? Right? Okay. So when tell me, well, that's his name. And, well, that's, yeah, Hebrew. But if they're speaking Greek, when the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to write the conversation between the angel and Joseph in Greek, did the Holy Spirit say, and by the way, Matthew, don't say Jesus, transliterate it as Yeshua. No, he says, write Jesus. Okay. 
What I'm trying to warn you against is a form of Gnosticism. 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 Why? This movement, the Hebrew roots movement, and you'll find it among Muslims. Muslims say, oh, you have to know Arabic. The miracle of the Quran is in Arabic. Well, this is what we call Gnosticism. What do I mean Gnosticism? Only a certain few have this knowledge, Gnosis. And you have to have this knowledge in order to truly understand God's revelation. And if, if you have this knowledge, you're part of the elite because not everyone has this knowledge. So you're special. You're special. This is a form of Gnosticism. You get my point? It's a form of Gnosticism. Any movement that tells you you have to have knowledge of a specific language in order to truly understand God's revelation, that's a form of Gnosticism. Why? Because not everyone has the time or the leisure or the money to study a language and master that language, making them feel as second or third class citizens and making them slaves to those who claim to have the knowledge, depending on them, for this secret knowledge in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek or Arabic because we're special. We're special. You get it? See, I'm special, folks, because I can say, oh, queridosmo, que oteosmo. See, I can say that I'm special. Or I'm special because I can say Deuteronomy 6 4 in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahovah. Eloheinu Yahovah Echad. See, I'm special. I'm so special. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. Ooh, it's funny, man. It's funny. It's a form of spiritual arrogance, arrogance and elitism. Right? It's a form of spiritual arrogance and elitism. Because you belong to an elite class. You know the languages. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Instead of just saying, blessed is he. Because you're special. All right. With that said, are we ready? How you doing, brother? Are we ready now? I was asked the question. Yeah, you know what? Interesting. What WTL? I don't know what WTL means. I was I was not asked I was asked a question but I was just told confirmation Hater Wood Hater Wood had to admit at Volcat they go bro you are blessed with natural acting ability acting talent I go you think they go yeah you just got it God gifted you in that area praise His holy name as long as I use it honestly with integrity to glorify Christ and then I will just be very special I'm so special <laughs> all right. Okay, let me answer the first question. Exactly, ACP. I act like I know my stuff. All right, we ready? First question that I was asked. Okay, Andrew Martin asked me this question the other day, and someone asked me in the comments uh, comment section, what does it mean when the Lord Jesus said, to Peter was given the keys of the kingdom? Is Andrew here? I just want to confirm. Okay, there he goes. Is that the part you want me to emphasize? What does it mean for Peter to be given the keys of the kingdom? You know, it's amazing, Sir Adit. I am the youngest of six siblings. Yeah, I can do all this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every. Okay. So Andrew wants me to break down what the Lord Jesus meant when he said to Peter, to you have been given the keys of king, the kingdom, and what you bind on loose shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Matthew 16, 19. So let's look at that. Let me answer that question first. There are two questions after that, and then open floor Q&A. Ask me what you want. Okay, hopefully pray in Jesus' name. The buffering doesn't become a problem. You said, I don't have 500K. Is that why? Oh, thank you, Magnificent Prophet. You won't be too magnificent when I send you on your merry way. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee the kingdoms, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, before I comment on that, Matthew 16, 19, a related question was, all right, but didn't our Lord Jesus Christ go on to call 
Peter Satan in the same chapter in Matthew 16, 23. So let's look at that passage. Pray for me to be filled with the Spirit to bless you because we're going to go into some meat right now. Are you ready for the meat? Now, Matthew 16, 23, let's look at that so that I can tie in both questions together because it's from the same chapter. Okay, Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So wait, how can Peter be the rock upon which the Lord Jesus Christ will build his church when the Lord Jesus just got done rebuking him, calling him a Satan? So these two questions I'm going to answer by the grace of God. Are you ready for the answers? Ready for the answers? By the grace of God? These two questions I'll answer. All right, if you're ready, pray. The Spirit guides me so I don't make any mistakes and that illuminates you to understand. Let's reread Matthew 16, 19. One, one more time. Let's read it again. One more time. Because I want you to see the advantage of reading the King James Bible, an advantage you won't have reading modern translations. Here's the advantage. Folks, pay attention to the pronouns. And I will give unto thee, thee. Notice the TH, the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and what, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. This is a feature in the King James not found in modern English translations. Anytime you see TH, when you see a pronoun, that's TH, like thou, thine, thy, the, it's singular. It's one. Anytime you see in the King James, the pronoun starts with a Y, like you, ye, your, it's two or more. You, ye, your, it's two or more. So notice in Matthew 16, 19, Jesus is speaking to Peter alone. And saying this to Peter alone, not to all the apostles. That's only in the King James, cue the one. This is why reading King James will help you. It gives you that advantage to know whether the original language, in the original language, it's singular or it's plural, two or more. Look at it again, Matthew 16, 19. Look at it again. Because now you're going to contrast it with Matthew 18, 18 in a minute. Matthew 16, 19. Watch here. The advantage of the King James. This feature is not found in English translations that use modern English. And I will give unto thee, remember, T-H in the King James is one. Thee, so he's not talking to the rest. Thee, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou, you, Peter, thou, shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. To appreciate this, let's compare it now with Matthew 18, 18. Matthew 18, 18. Watch here to appreciate this. Matthew 18, 18. Now notice how the pronouns change. Notice the pronouns change. Verily I say unto you. Oh, it's no longer I say unto thee. Whatsoever ye, not thee. Whatsoever thou, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Did you see how the pronouns changed? Thank our brother Protestant for slaving for us for the sake of Jesus Christ. He doesn't get bait to do this. He does it as a token of love. Let's put Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18 back to back. Matthew 16, 19, 18, 18, back to back to appreciate the change in the pronouns and why the King James is a glorious, blessed translation that has an advantage over modern versions if you don't know the original languages. Matthew 16, 19, and 18, 18, back to back. Now read with me again. Notice how the pronouns switch. Notice, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now contrast it with Matthew 18, 18. Verily I say unto you, it's not thee. 
You, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. You see, in Matthew 16, 19, he was speaking to Peter alone. To thee, you, Peter, I give the king, keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you, Peter, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And what you, Peter, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But then, in Matthew 18, 18, he's talking to all the disciples. What all of you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What all of you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jamie Curry, can you do me a favor, please? Can you stop chiming in with the wrong verses? Isaiah 22, 22 is not what's being mentioned in Matthew 16, 19. Don't become a Catholic apologist on me because the keys of the house of David is in the hands of Jesus in Revelation 3, 7 to 8. No, it's not, Jamie. Jamie, let me try this again. Isaiah 22, 22 has nothing to do with Matthew 16, 19. That's the key of the house of David, singular. In Matthew 16, 19, it's the keys of the kingdom, plural. But the parallel to Isaiah 22, 22 is Revelation 3, 7. Stop misapplying passages because you've heard Catholic apologists mislead you. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, Jamie. Let me now correct you because now you're going to give me a teaching moment why you don't blindly follow anything and everything you hear from your favorite apologist. Guys, did you see how she or he misapplied Isaiah 22, 22? Let me teach you how not to interpret the Bible. Listen, Benjamin, I don't know if you, you're aware. My channel is for everyone. Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, Nestorian, Protestants. Because I've said it before, I'll say it again. I believe there are born-again Christians in all the major branches of Christianity. What I don't tolerate is people taking this as an opportunity to try to, quote-unquote, proselytize or quote their favorite arguments that they think support their position. See, I know where Jamie's coming from because I've been studying these arguments since 1999. Chaldean knows. Chaldean Assyrians, my brother in Christ. And Chaldean, have I ever made you feel uncomfortable because of your affiliation? Have I ever done that to you? And I get a lot of heat from my fellow Protestant brothers, even those who are Reformed. They think I'm compromised and maybe even ecumenical because I hold the position that there are born-again Christians, born-again Christians in all the major branches of Christianity, even those who don't teach sola fide, that you're justified by faith alone. That's my conviction. That's my belief. That's my understanding. But now let me correct the misapplication of Isaiah 22, 22 from Jamie. Jamie, don't ever come here and misquote scripture because you heard Scott Hahn or Patrick Madrid or any other apologist misapply Isaiah 22, 22 and connect it with Matthew 16, 19 because Isaiah 22, 22 is not paralleled with Matthew 16, 19. It's paralleled with Revelation 3, 7. Okay. Guys, you see, this is what happens when people chime in. Lord, have mercy on us, Father. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. We struggle, crucify our flesh. And Lord, please give me the grace to be more patient for your glory, Lord, so I don't cause people to stumble. Please, Lord. Let me tell you what she or he did. Still didn't identify if it's a brother or a sister. Isaiah 22, 22. Let me show you how not to interpret scripture. Okay. Isaiah 22, 22. Okay. This is what this person did. Too much Scott Hahn is going to Hanaize you. Okay. This is what the person quoted. Uh, guys, pay attention to the language. And the key singular of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Now pay attention. Key singular. Job is going to give the key to the house of David. The, the magisterial stewardship. The, the key to the house of David to this individual. Okay. Whatever he opens, no one can shut. Whatever he shuts, no one can open. Okay. Somehow they want you to believe this is parallel to Matthew 16, 19. Matthew 16, 19. Watch here. Watch how this is going to backfire against Curry. Well, now all of a sudden went silent on me. Matthew 16, 19. Well, watch, watch. Key, house of David, 
What he opens, no one shall shut. What he shuts, no one shall open. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You notice the difference between key and keys? Key of the house of David. Keys, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. That's number one. Number two, let me show you the true parallel of Isaiah 22, 22. Revelation 3, 7 to 8. Revelation 3, verses 7 to 8. Watch. Watch here. Watch here. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Do you see how dishonest it is? How wickedly dishonest it is to misapply Isaiah 22, 22? Connected with Matthew 16, 19. But that's what happens to you, Curry, when you just listen to Catholic apologists. You get it? That's what happens, Curry, when you keep burning incense and candles to your apologists that you've turned into idols and don't trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and listen to various opinions. Stop making idols out of the people you like. Okay? Thank you, Benjamin. That's why I appreciate, respect, love, Trent Horn. You with me there? Now, folks, do you see any connection with Isaiah 22, 22 and Matthew 16, 19? Or is the connection between Isaiah 22, 22 and what Jesus says in Revelation 3, 7 to 8? Jesus has the key to David. That's why in that same context, he uses the same language of opening doors that no man can shut, shutting doors that no man can open. It's tiring because people just want to hear those that tickle their ears. You're Catholic, you're going to run to Scott Hahn. You're a Protestant, you're going to run to James White. And if you're a, if you're a Molinist, Protestant Molinist, you're going to run to William Lane Craig. If you're a Calvinist, that's a Protestant, you're going to run to John, John MacArthur, John Piper. Folks, listen to a variety of Christian voices from different denominations so you don't get stuck in your own group, in your own camp, and then you wither and you don't grow. You get my point? I don't know what in the world Delhi Grap is, is griping about when he says how many keys on a key ring. What has that got to do with key of David, keys of the kingdom of heaven? Here, let me scratch my head for Daily Gripe. Hold on. He's got a gripe, and every day he has to air it out. William Lane Craig, that, that giant Christian apologist, meaning intellectual, spiritual giant that eats up atheists for breakfast. Okay, now now that we got rid of this red herring, this, this detour, can we come back to Matthew 16, 19, and 18, 18? Right? Is it clear now? Folks, do you see the amazing? See? Okay, if you're not if you're not Catholic, you're 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 Orthodox. Convince me you're not one of these churches. Convince me that you're not one of these churches that do believe in apostolic succession, Petrine primacy, and argues that your particular church is a, su a successor to Peter. Tell me I'm wrong, Curry. If I'm wrong, then Daily Gripe will repent for my error. He'll apologize for my error. Convince me. Okay, now, Matthew 16, 19, and Matthew 18, 18, one more time. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, one more time. I know, they do, Turb. They don't, because Turb, you know what it is? I, I've noticed this. Guys, I listen, because I'm a sinner, I'm fallen. I'm a sinner, I'm fallen, okay? I'm impacted and affected by the fall, and I have needs, and I want attention, and I want love. You know what this is a sign of? I'll be honest with you guys. You got things I'm wrong. 
This is a sign of a need of someone to be heard that needs attention because that person is damaged psychologically and emotionally and needs affirmation. We all need it to some extent. We all need it. To some extent, we all need it. Why? Because we're created to be loved by God, to be filled with the love of God, and to be in love with God. And if we're not being filled with God and his love, we're going to look for attention and fulfillment some other place from some other source. So there's a need for us to be affirmed and loved. And sometimes we do that by pontificating or saying something. See, look, look at me. You see? Look, look. I can, I, I can, I can make points too. It's a need. We all have it. Some worse than others. Some worse than others. I'm being honest with you. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So now Jamie Curry is a Protestant. I'm impressed. The Protestant wants to connect Isaiah 22, 22 to Matthew 16, 19. Now, Daily Gripe, apologize to Jamie Curry. Please, apologize. Anyway, Jamie Curry, again, I ask, I tell you, don't ever cross-reference Isaiah 22, 22, Matthew 16, 19. That's wrong use of Isaiah 22, 22. It's wrong. And you have heard it from a Catholic or an Orthodox, unless a Protestant you heard it from was also influenced by a Catholic or an Orthodox and made that connection. It's a wrong connection, wrong application. Okay? Of course, Irene. We all do. I'm admitting it. I have a need because I'm broken, right? I'm tainted. I'm fallen. And I have low self-esteem. I have low self-worth, right? So, of course, I need to be affirmed and loved. Like I said, everyone does to some extent. Everyone does to some extent. Okay, now, Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18. Matthew 16, 19 and Matthew 18, 18. Let's focus now. Let's refocus by the grace of Jesus Christ. Let me answer Andrew Martin's question, right? Let me answer the other gentleman's question, George Wagner's question about Peter being called Satan. Okay. Pay attention now, Matthew 16, 19. Notice the change of the pronouns. T-H, notice the change of the pronouns. T-H, meaning the words thee, thou, thine, thy, singular one. When you see the word why, ye, you, your, that's two or more. Notice the change. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee, singular, you, Peter, thee, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind, thou, not you, thou, not ye, thou, you, you, Peter, shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou, not ye, not you, thou, shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. But now notice. The parallel, Matthew 18, 18. Verily I send to you. It's not thee. It's now all of them. All the disciples. You. That's why it's now you. The word why. Right? Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Folks, did you notice the difference now? You notice the difference now? There's one thing Jesus Christ granted the rest of the disciples in union with Peter. And there's one thing Jesus Christ gave to Peter alone and did not share it with the disciples. If you reread the passages, the Lord Jesus gave Peter one special blessing and privilege. He did not extend to the disciples. But the other blessing and privilege he then granted to the disciples as well. If you read carefully, what was the one privilege, blessing, and honor conferred on Peter alone, not granted to the other disciples? If you reread the passages. Anyone? No, it's in Matthew 16, 19, 18, 18. We're not going back to Matthew 16, 18. No, not, we're not going back to Matthew 16, 18. Don't introduce something we haven't discussed. It's right there in the verses we looked at. It's there. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18. Nope, not that, George Wagner. We didn't quote Matthew 16, 18. 
We quoted Matthew 16, 19, 18, 18. Guys, please pay attention, focus. Either I'm not communicating clear, clearly, not focusing. And I want to be a taskmaster because I want to make sure you're focusing and getting it because I want you to know this and apply it for the glory of Jesus. Benjamin, no. Let's try it again. There's one blessing, one privilege the Lord Jesus gave to Peter alone that he did not grant or extend to the other disciples. Who got it? 1611, Protestant. Cue the one, first, last. John, you got it. The keys of the kingdom. The binding, the loosening or loosing, he gave it to all the disciples, not just Peter. But the keys of the kingdom, that blessing was to Peter alone, and he did not extend it to the rest. Now think about why. What do you do with keys? The keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do you do with a key? You lock and unlock, right? You close, you open, right? You with me there? So why was Peter singled out for the keys of the kingdom? Because it would be through the mouth of Peter that God would unlock the, the gates of the kingdom to the Jew first and the Gentile. That's why it's not a coincidence that the first sermon that the apostles preached after Jesus' ascension into heaven, when they were filled with life and power from the Spirit, was headed by Peter. It's not a coincidence that at Pentecost, when they're Spirit-filled, and they're now speaking in tongues as a miraculous confirmation. The Spirit now filled them and empowered them to carry out the orders of Christ and advance the kingdom. It is Peter who preached and got 3,000 Jews saved. And it's not a coincidence that when the first Gentile was converted and brought into the kingdom, Cornelius and his household, it was Peter singled out and sent to convert him. Let's go to Acts 15, 7 to 11. Acts 15, 7 to 11. Keys not authority, keys to open something, Frank. So he had the authority in that sense to open the kingdom to the Jews and Gentiles. And here's the proof. Peter said it, Acts 15, 7 to 11. And when there had been much disputing, Acts 15, 7 to 11, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He singled me out for the privilege of converting the first Gentiles of opening the kingdom to the Gentiles. Now that I've discharged my duty and I've opened up the keys, I'll open up the kingdom, the gates of the kingdom, Paul will now take over preaching to the Gentiles. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt... Sorry, let me go there. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So who did God single out to open the gates of the kingdom of heaven with the keys given to him, to the Jews and the Gentiles? Peter. Peter. Now that Peter opened the gates of the kingdom of heaven to the Gentiles, who then takes over the ministry to the Gentiles? Paul. Who was the first person that stood up on Pentecost after Jesus entered physically in heaven in his glorified physical body, sits enthroned in heaven and pours out the Holy Spirit upon the disciples on earth and fills them with the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry? Who is the one disciple, one apostle who stands up preaches, 
to the multitude, resulting in 3,000 Jews being saved? Peter. Yep, that's where it comes from, rude boy Q. That's where it comes from, rude boy Q. That Peter will be standing by the gates of heaven, enter, allowing people to enter and shutting the door upon them. So he discharged his duties. He took the keys and opened the gates. Now they're open. You want me there? Yep, that's where it came from. You know that joke where Peter will be by the gates of heaven, allowing people to come in or stopping people? It comes from this, the, that he's given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the heavens. So now, Andrew, did you understand what it meant for Peter to be given the keys and not the rest? The Lord Jesus singled him out with that honor, that glorious honor of being the one to lead the first Jewish Converts and Gentile converts to saving faith in Christ. Don't self-adjust. I don't know what you mean. Just because my narrow shoulder is my big head. Everyone got it or no? So what about the binding and loosing? What about the binding and loosing? That was given to Peter and all the disciples. No, Tony, he's gone. He's left the earth. He can't do anything anymore. His duty was to open the gates of the kingdom of heaven through the preaching of the word while he was on earth. He discharged his responsibility. But now the way he can shut the, 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 gate of heaven upon a Gentile or a Jew on earth. You know how he could do it? He could shut it in their face on earth. You know how? How? He could have done it while he was on earth. Say the door is closed for you. You know how? Can someone guess? Yep, Andrew. No, no, not yeah. By not preaching, but also... By preaching and telling someone who rejects the gospel, because you've rejected the gospel, because you don't below, be believe, you will not see heaven. You're going to hell. Exactly, Mike, Michael Panorius. He did it to Sama, Simon the Magi in Acts 8, and he also did it to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, 1 to 11, when they lied to him, thinking they'd get away with it, and he warned them. Right, and they were struck dead and killed by God. Acts 5 1 to 11. So, the way Peter can shut the gates of heaven while he was on earth is by saying, You refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, you refuse to accept Jesus Christ, you will not see the face of God, you're going to hell. You get it now? So, their authority to close or his authority. To shut the gate of heaven or to open the gate of heaven is by the preaching and telling someone straight up, you believe, receive, you're saved, you enter. You reject and resist, you stand condemned and you go to hell. Right? But do you know in a sense that we too share in that authority? What do I mean? I don't have the authority of the apostles. I don't have the authority of Paul. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying in a sense... We share that authority when I say to a Muslim, if you deny Jesus Christ and you don't believe he's the son of God and you didn't die, believe Muhammad, you're going to hell. You won't see the face of God. You want me there? All right. So in light of Peter, why was he given the keys? Because it was the honor that Jesus conferred upon him to open the gates of the kingdom of heaven through the preaching. He opened it. That's it. To open it for the Jews and open it for the Greeks. To open the gate, the door to heaven, or open the gates, plural, open them for the Jews and the Greeks, and he did it. He did what the Lord told him to do with those keys. He did it.
Pastino, I wasn't there to see if he repented and entered the kingdom. Peter warns him, may you and your money perish. He goes, now pray to God. Perhaps God will forgive you. So I don't know. You want me to guess? I can't. I can't go beyond what is written. You want me there? So everyone got that, right? Is that clear to everybody? That's in Acts 8, the story of Simon the Magi. You can start reading at 1 to see what happened. Philip, because of persecution, Philip went, started preaching to the Samaritans, went to Samaritan villages. A bunch of them believed, converted, got baptized because he had done signs and wonders. But none of them received the gift of the Holy Spirit until Peter and John came down, laid hands on them. Simon the Magi, who was a magician, who was bewitching people by sorcery, when he saw the people received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, he offered Peter and John money to get the ability to give people the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, may you and your money perish. And then Simon struck with fear and terror. He goes, please, you know, ask God to forgive me. He goes, pray, maybe God will forgive you. Why should I change my laundry deterrence? Okay. It's just because I'm looking at my narrow shoulders and my big head, big fat head. David Wood isn't lying when he says, if I want to lose 50 pounds of ugly fat, chop off my head. It's like I'm shrinking, but my head keeps getting bigger. Okay, now, if that's clear and you got it, if that's clear and you got it, can I move on to the second point? If you got it. Anyone still confused before I move on? Did everyone get it? So there's no one confused. So I can move on to the second point. George Wagner is here. He asked me that question. Two for the price of one. Okay, but the Lord Jesus Christ called Peter Satan in Matthew 16, 23. How does that impact or affect my exegesis that Peter is the rock? The same way it impacts the fact that Jesus said Peter would be given the keys of the kingdom and that what he binds on earth shall be bound in heaven and loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'll come back to that, what that means to Andrew. I haven't forgotten that part. Okay, let's read Matthew 16. Let's read 18 to 23. Matthew 16, 18 to 23. Matthew 16, 18 to 23. Let's see the second part of the question. Matthew 16, 18 and 23. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go up unto Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now 22, 23. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. This is not going to happen to you. You're the Christ. You're the king. You're going to destroy Israel's enemies. They can't kill you. 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest, desirest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Okay, now, Jesus said, Peter is a Satan. How does this impact, how does this affect the fact that Peter is the rock upon which Jesus will build his church? The same way it would impact the fact that Peter would be given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever he looses on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, does the one nullify the other? Just because here he's called Satan, does that all of a sudden undo and nullify what Jesus said would be true of Peter? You will be given the keys. You will bind. You will loose. Does that change that reality? In other words, does Peter's error and mistake in thinking Messiah can't be killed, thereby becoming a Satan trying to cause Jesus to stumble? 
nullify the very promise. You will be given the keys of the kingdom. You will bind. You will loose. No, right? He still will be given the keys. He still will bind and loose. He'll still be the rock. Are you getting now, George Wagner? The one doesn't nullify the other. And you guys are already getting the answer. Kent's got it. Michael got it. This blessing of being the rock and of being given the keys and of binding and loosing will come after Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, after the outpouring of the Spirit, after Peter is filled with the Spirit, after Peter is illuminated by the Spirit, after Peter finally gets it. Because up until that time, Jesus is promising these blessings that are future in time to a group of people who are still weak, who are still carnal, who are still fleshly-minded, carnal-minded, and do not have the Holy Spirit. You with me there? How do I know that when Peter said what he said, he wasn't walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. He hadn't received the Holy Spirit. It's only after he received the Spirit, after he's empowered by the Spirit, after the Holy Spirit indwells him, transforms him, illuminates him, enables him to get it. From that moment on, he'll be the rock. From that moment on, he'll be given the keys. From that moment on, what he binds shall be bound. What he looses shall be loosed. Let me show you. John 7, 38 to 39. 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 Watch. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they believe on him, should receive. For the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, was not yet given. So when Peter said this, the Spirit wasn't indwelling him, empowering him, illuminating him. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. John 14, verses 16 to 17. John 14, verses 16 to 17. The Spirit, both. When Jesus breathed on them after his resurrection, they were given spiritual life, and then the Spirit was poured out upon them then to empower them and fill them to do ministry. John 14, 16 to 17. Pay attention now. John 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with, with you. He's dwelling with you in the person of Christ and shall be in you. In the future, he'll be in you. He's not in you yet. John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So though the Comforter Spirit is with me, in me, working in union with me, he's not in you. So I have to go and be glorified. Then he'll be in you, working through you, empowering you, and illuminating you. John 16, 12 to 13. John 16, 12 to 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, when he is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and will show you things to come. So you can't bear the things I want to reveal to you now. They're too much for you to handle. They're above your pay grade. They're... Above your ability to comprehend. But when the spirit of truth comes, when he comes, then he'll enable you and take you to a higher level to take in these things, understand these things, 
and proclaim them to others. George Wagner, is so far you with me? You with me so far? Amen, Jason. Amen, amen. Acts 1, 5 to 8. I like how Michael Ponarius is writing a commentary to what I'm saying. Michael, when you come up with the commentary, exegeting all my statements, let me know. Maybe I can advertise it. Because if you notice what this guy keeps doing, everything I say something, he, he's, he comments. Thank you, man. I didn't know that someone's going to actually write a commentary on my preaching. Appreciate it. Acts 1, 5 to 8. For John truly baptized with water. John truly <laughs> baptized with water. He, he, he smiled. Watch. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Pay attention, Acts 1, 5 to 8. Jesus speaking to the disciples before he sends to heaven. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they, when they, they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Would thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Now notice Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Did you catch it? You'll receive power not many days from now. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when he does, then you'll be my witnesses, starting in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Okay. Could the Bible be any clearer? Could the Bible be any clearer? That up until Jesus' glorification and ascension to heaven, the disciples did not receive the Holy Spirit to regenerate them and then to empower them to do the work of God, to advance the kingdom of God in the power of the Spirit, and to understand the things that they could not understand and they were not ready to take in. Everyone got it? Everyone got it? What about you, George Wagner? You got it? Just want to make sure he got it because this was his question. If he's still here, I don't know if he is. I think he probably left. Anyway, so, yes, Peter was called Satan. And yes, Peter's still the rock. And yes, Peter will be given the keys of the kingdom. And yes, Peter will bind things on earth that are bound in heaven and loose things on earth that are loose in heaven because those blessings are future. Those spiritual blessings and privileges are future. Jesus is promising him what he will receive and what he'll become in the future after Christ is glorified, after, after the Spirit immerses Peter in his power and his presence and illuminates him. But up until that time... Peter was still fleshly, carnal, unregenerate, and couldn't fully comprehend the things he was seeing and hearing. Everyone there? Everyone got it? I want to make sure you got it. Now, George, are you getting why he could say something that was in opposition to God's will? Even after being promised by the Lord Jesus, he will be the rock. He will be given the keys. He will bind and lose. Yes. So I just want, to, want you to get that point. If you're born of the Spirit, George, you are now indwelt by the Spirit that indwelt Peter later on. And now in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can crucify your fleshly nature and walk in the life and the freedom given by the Spirit. If you're born again, you have the Spirit. Now the Spirit, you ask Him to keep filling you and give you power over your flesh. When Peter said this, he did not have the Holy Spirit indwelling him and filling him. 
You, on the other hand, have the Spirit indwelling you and filling you. I just want to make sure you got it. Did you get it? And I want to make sure George got it. Send Jesse on his merry way. Jesse is here just to distract and make fun. Okay. Now, does it mean that Peter was actually possessed of Satan? A lot of people think when the Lord Jesus called Peter Satan, it means, see, you're possessed of Satan. Satan is controlling you and influencing you. Is that what it means? Was it Satan speaking through him? Was it Satan deceiving him? No. Here's where we get confused. The term Satan, both in Hebrew and Greek, means an adversary, an opposer, someone who opposes you. You don't have to be that evil spirit called Satan to be a Satan. You with me there? The term Satan, both in Hebrew and Greek, simply means an adversary, an opposer. So when Jesus called him Satan, he wasn't saying, oh, because Satan's in you, Satan's speaking through you. It was simply to say, you are an adversary who's opposing me and God's will for me. You get it? It cannot mean that the evil being called Satan, that evil spirit being called Satan, was prompting Peter and speaking through Peter. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because Satan wanted to have Jesus killed. But Peter didn't want Jesus to be killed. Satan wanted Jesus to be killed, but Peter didn't want Jesus to be killed. How do I know Satan wanted Jesus to be killed? Luke 22, verses 1 to 5. Luke 22, verses 1 to 5. Now, I'm assuming that the different books of the Bible are not contradictory, but they're consistent because they're inspired by the same spirit. Okay? Luke 22, verses 1 to 5. Now, the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Pay attention to verse 3. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas. Then entered Satan into Judas. Now, that's that evil spirit being. Surname Ishariot, Ishariot, Iscariot, being of the number of the 12. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted, covenanted to give him money. Did you guys catch it? Satan entered Judas and moved Judas to betray him so he can be killed. John 13, verse 2. John 13, verse 2. John 13, verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now we know it's talking about that spirit being. That spirit being entered Judas, prompted Judas, moved Judas to betray Jesus, to get Jesus killed. John 13, 27. John 13, verse 27. Benjamin, everything good is from the triune God. Everything perfect comes from him as a grace to us for the glory of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So the Lord Jesus be glorified. John 13, 27. And after the sup, after Jesus gave Judas the bread, the sup, the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. That thou doest do quickly. Everyone got it? So did Satan want Jesus to be betrayed and killed? Yes. Do you see it there? Does Satan want Jesus to be betrayed and killed? Of course. Walter, you're going to have a problem in a minute. But anyway. But Peter didn't want Jesus to be killed. Wayne. You know you need to leave, right? 
Yep. No, I didn't say that was plural. Sai Christian, because you also are trying to follow Muhammad Sunnah and being illiterate. I never said that was plural. So why don't you stop being a Muhammadan? Stop being illiterate. I said TH is singular. Thou, thy, thee, thine. You sure you're not Arabian? Because I've yet to meet a, meet a Syrian as illiterate as you. By the way, I know Saeed Christian. We're friends, unfortunately. You know, we used to hang out with each other, unfortunately. He's proof of predestination. I had no choice in meeting him. I had no choice in being his friend. It was predestined for me. He makes a strong case for Calvinism. Because if I had choice, I would never speak. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Peter wanted Jesus to be killed. I'm sorry. Thank you, Sai Christian. Peter didn't want Jesus to be killed. Holy Spirit, take over for the glory of Christ. Peter opposed the idea of Jesus being killed. But Satan entered Judas, prompted Judas to betray Jesus so he can be killed. Now, remember what Jesus said? If Satan's kingdom is divided, how can it stand? If Satan opposes himself, how can he stand? Walter, I know you think you're intelligent and you know the Bible, but you're only exposing, exposing that you're an idiot and a moron and that David Wood is smarter than you. Satan did not want Jesus. You see, I almost got me to say what you just said. Satan did not know that Jesus' death would be his destruction. Now, Walter, before I send you on your merry way, 1 Corinthians 2, 8 says that if the rulers of this world knew, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, Walter, could you prove any more that you're probably one of the most biblically illiterate people I've met in my life? 1 Corinthians 2, 8. I almost got to say what he said. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, Walter, to show why you're a biblical buffoon, one of the rulers of this age is the devil. If the devil knew that Jesus' death would be his destruction, he would not want Jesus to die. But by entering Judas and moving Judas to have Jesus killed, that shows he had no clue that the cross would be his destruction because 1st 2 8 says the rulers plural of this age had they known they would not want the Lord of glory to be crucified but they did crucify the Lord of glory they did want the Lord of glory to be crucified because rulers plural include Satan unless you believe that Satan's not the ruler of this world see now Walter is again showing the guy is really biblically illiterate Peter told Jesus, you will not be killed after Jesus told him that the Son of Man has to be killed. And the apostles did not understand, could not figure out the prophecies because it was kept from them. Luke 18, 31 to 34. And then, Walter, you got to go. Never to come back here. Luke 18, 31 to 34. Hello, dummy. Hello, moron. They did not understand the prophecies, Walter. Moron. Here is the refutation to show you need to go back to kindergarten. Luke 18, 31 and 34. Guy, is this guy stupid or what? Now read, guys. Notice how the Bible is going to show this guy's stupid and he makes David Wood look like a theologian. Luke 18, 31, 34. Walter, read this before you get banned. Read this before I ban you. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Pay attention, Walter, because you're going to get banned right after this. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So wait, Jesus just said, everything written about me and the prophets must be fulfilled. And they didn't get it, Walter, because it was cut from them. Time for you to get out of here. Send him out his merry way. Bye-bye. Send our friend out of here. Okay. You see why I have to treat people the way we do?
You see why? Okay. Let me repeat again. The Bible is quite clear. If the devil knew that the cross would be the destruction of his kingdom, he would have done any, everything in his power to stop Jesus. But Luke 22, let me repeat. Luke 22, verse 3. John, John 13, verse 2. John 13, 27 says that the devil, Satan, entered Judas, prompted Judas, put it in Judas's heart to betray Jesus so that he could be killed. That tells you that the devil thought that by killing Jesus, he'd be destroying God's will for the son. And to further confirm that, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, had they known the rulers, plural, Satan's one of them, of this world, this age, would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Meaning the rulers did crucify the Lord of glory. Meaning they wanted the Lord of glory killed. And one of those rulers would be the devil, confirmed by what we read in Luke 22, verse 3, John 13, verse 2, John 13, 27. Satan wanted Jesus to be killed because he did not know. Could the Bible be any clearer, folks? No, Satan was not in Peter, Joe. Joe, can you read that passage? Jesus did not say, you savor the things of the devil. He goes, you savor the things of men. He wasn't condemning him for being satanic, thinking like Satan. He was condemning him for having the thoughts of men, specifically Jewish men, who could not fathom a dying and rising Messiah. Joe, read it. He doesn't say Satan has entered him and spoken through him and inspired him. Matthew 16, 23. So you wait, wait. He just condemned Jesus as making no sin. Joe, I'm going to muzzle you like the dog you are because Jesus just said you savor the things of men. Here it goes. Notice he just blasphemed Jesus, this filthy dog. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You just said, you wicked, filthy dog. It doesn't make sense that he savored the things of men, calling Jesus a liar. Muzzle this wicked, blasphemous dog. Get him out of here. To hell you go. And you wonder why I'm so nice. Yes, I need help not to lay hands on dogs like you that blaspheme Jesus. You filthy dog. Yeah, baby. It's a birthday. Go, Sammy. Go, Sammy. Birthday. Go, Sammy. Okay. Okay, but no, guys, it's okay. You hear what he just said? The guy just said, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to say that Jesus... Or that Peter savored the things of men. Wait. But that's what Jesus exactly said. Peter, you do not savor the things of God, but the things of men. Matthew 16, 23. Matthew 16, 23. Read it one more time. Did Jesus not just say, Peter... For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Did Jesus say, you, Peter, desire the things of men, which this filthy dog says makes no sense? He just said it makes no sense that Peter would savor the things of men. The very thing Jesus said, that's exactly what Peter was savoring. You see why I called him a filthy, wicked dog for blaspheming the Lord? Guys, I'm not going to be politically correct and tickle your ears. You say something stupid of that magnitude and impugn the Lord Jesus and indirect, indirectly say that Jesus had no idea what he's talking about and directly blaspheme him, I'm going to then disrespect you to the umpteenth degree. For those of you paying attention, to those of you paying attention, is it clear, is it clear I do have Patreon, Benjamin. I have Patreon because I'm in ministry, so you can support there. And you can also support by going to PayPal. Is it clear that Jesus did not say to Peter, you desire, savor the things of the devil, not of God? 
Is it clear that Jesus actually said, you savor, you desire the things of men, not of God? Yeah, here goes the filthy dog under another name, Cletus. Cletus, I agree with Joe that you're still upset because you don't know which dog pound you were born in. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yippee, yo. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yippee, yo. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yippee, yo. Okay, so what's the point? Pay attention. For those of you who are focused, let's pay attention. Pay attention in Jesus' name. Peter was called Satan not because the devil himself was in him prompting him. He was called Satan because the word in Greek and Hebrew simply mean an adversary, an opposer who opposes someone. An adversary, an opposer. So Jesus is saying, get behind me, you opposer, you adversary, because you're opposing God's will for me because you're thinking like men. You're thinking like the Jews who cannot fathom, envision, accept a Messiah who will be killed by his enemies only to rise victorious. The proof that it cannot be the evil spirit, Satan, prompting him is because in Luke 22, verse 3, John 13, verse 2, John 13, 27, that evil spirit, that evil being, a spiritual creature who hates God and those who seek to follow God, that evil rebellious spirit being called the devil, Satan, entered Judas, prompted Judas to negotiate the betrayal of Jesus and then to bring the soldiers to arrest Jesus so Jesus could be killed. So that evil being called Satan wanted Jesus killed. But Peter, that Satan, didn't want Jesus to be killed. So either Satan is divided and opposes himself and his kingdom cannot stand, or Peter is be call, being called Satan in a generic sense, not that, that the evil being is prompting you, but you're an adversary opposing me because you're thinking like men that Messiah can't die. Which makes more sense contextually? Which makes more sense contextually? That Peter is possessed of the devil or Peter is a devil, an adversary who opposes the things of God? If you believe that scripture interprets scripture and the Bible is consistent, which makes sense contextually? Peter is filled with the same devil that filled Judas or that Peter is a devil, not that he's filled by the devil because he's acting like a devil in opposing God's will for Christ. You with me there? You getting it so far? So if that's clear, if it's making sense, let's focus. Let's refocus. Okay. Can I show you that even the angel of the Lord is called Satan? Can I show you that the angel of the Lord is called Satan in the Hebrew Bible? Did you know that? The angel of the Lord is called Satan in Hebrew. Numbers 22 Numbers 22, verses 22 to 23. This is going to confirm the point I'm making. Yep, Numbers 22, 22 to 23. This is going to confirm the point I've been making. Go there. Now read, though. Read. And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of Jehovah stood in the way for an adversary against him. Pay attention. For an adversary against him adversary against him the angel of jehovah is an adversary against balaam balaam now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him and the ass saw the angel of jehovah standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way numbers 22 31 to 32 numbers 22 31 to 32 okay let me get the uh, interlinear Sorry, let me get it for you. Okay. 
Then Jehovah opened the eyes of Balaam, Balaam, and he saw the angel of Jehovah standing in the way and a sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of Jehovah said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee. I went out to oppose thee because thy way is perverse before me. Guys, here's the link to the Hebrew, Numbers 22, 22. Click on that link. Click on that link. I lost the link. Where's the link? What happened here? Hmm. Sorry, hold on, hold on, guys. Click on that link. It wouldn't open up for me. One second. Click on the link. Here goes. When it says, Angel of Jehovah stood as an adversary, as an adversary, the word is Satan. The angel of Jehovah was a Satan to Baal Balaam. Look at it. He's called Satan there. The angel of Jehovah, who is God Almighty, who is Jesus Christ, is called Satan. Right there in Hebrew. No, right here. It should work, man. What do you mean it's not opening? It just opened up, you little sinners. There you go. Here's the link again. Talk about the evil one trying to distract us, huh? It's working for me, folks. Try it again. Can someone go to BibleUp.com then and get the link? It's working for me. You little sinners. Is it working now? Okay. Do you see? Do you see where the angel Lord is called Satan? All right, guys, we can be here all day and debate why that link doesn't work, or someone can go there to BibleHub.com and look at Indian link and get it. I don't know what to do. You want me to pray and exercise my computer? You want me? I can do that. It's working now, guys. It's working fine. Even Cindy, it's working for her. Did you guys get it? It's working. Cindy, is it working for you? Yeah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Protestant, you there or somebody first last? You guys want to go and get the link or we're going to be here till the rapture? Is it working now? Is it working? First last, everyone else that says it's working, man. Little sinners. Here, he got it. Protestant believer. Okay, your, your entire Bible is not working. Okay, I see it. Okay, for those if it's working. Okay, is it working now? Yeah, this is going to take. What the server's down. We were saving along on a moonlight day. Where we're saving on sailing along. Okay. This now, can you guys try it again? Cindy, do you, I'm gonna take a picture that it's working for me and I'm gonna post the picture so you guys can see it's working. It's working. It's working. We were sailing along in a moonlight bay. Here, let me take a picture. I'm going to take a picture. All you haters, man. Here it goes. Okay, here you go. Okay, watch here. You see? It's working. It's not a risk, man. Don't be scared. Let's see. It's working. Hello. Even my ears not working. Come on, man. What happened here, bro? Why aren't you working, bro? What's up with that? Ah, who cares? Yeah, we're going to be here all day until we get this figured out. Yeah, because you guys got to go on the privacy setting at the bottom and say it's you'll advance. When you get a privacy error, folks, there it's going to say, click, proceed to Bible Hub, and you'll proceed. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. No, but you guys got to see the word for yourself. 
Allahu Akbar. Assalamu Akbar. Okay, finally it's starting to work. Pins and needles, needles and pins. Happy man's man. That's why I'll never, uh, my website will never take off. My YouTube will never, never take off. I got too many issues. Okay, is it working now for everybody? Yeah, I know, Andrew. I was trying. It didn't work. Okay. Yeah, you ain't lying. You know, this must be deep stuff and advanced stuff when we get these kind of technical difficulties. That means Satan's upset. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. Okay. Do you see the word now or no? Numbers 22, 22, and 32. Do you guys see it now or no? It took us longer than we needed. Anyway. Do you see that the angel of Jehovah is said to be a Satan? Do you see that the link says the angel of Jehovah, la Satan, la Satan, a Satan? The angel of Jehovah is Balaam's Satan. The word is Satan. Do you see it? How can Je the angel of Jehovah be Satan? How can the angel of Jehovah be Satan? But then I want you to look at Numbers 22, 32, where the angel of God speaking, he says, I've come to be a Satan to you. Here it is. Here's the link. Go read it. Behold, I have come out to stand against you. But literally it's, I've come out to be Satan against you, to be a Satan to you. Coffee morning. Even though I'm arrogant, you can't do anything to silence me. And you're going to be a coward dog hiding behind the screen. Send coffee morning to tea evening. No, Satan, here is Hebrew, Michael Ponarius. I know everything is Greek for you, and you think Greek is a mystical language. This is Hebrew, Michael. Hebrew. Hebrew. Okay. Now, did everyone get it? Do you guys see the angel of Jehovah is called Satan? Numbers 22, 22. Numbers 22, 32, in the Hebrew, it says the angel of Jehovah came to be a Satan to Balaam, Balaam, came to be Satan to Balaam. Numbers 22, 32, the angel says, I've come to be Satan to you. I've come to be Satan to you. Did you guys get it now? Okay. Are you now seeing... Biblical proof, biblical proof. Is Marcy still here, by the way? Are you now seeing biblical proof that the word Satan doesn't always refer to that spirit being, that evil spirit being? Because the word Satan in Hebrew and Greek means adversary, opposer, someone who's adverse to you, who opposes you. Do you guys see it? Zena, did you see confirmation? It took me longer than necessary to finish this point. I'm going to have to do another live Q&A. So then what's my point, George, if you're still here, Wagner? When Jesus calls Peter Satan, he's not saying you're possessed of the devil. You're filled with the devil. You are a devil. You're an adversary to me. You're trying to oppose me and oppose God's will for me. That's all he's saying. When you take this approach, there's no contradiction with Peter being a Satan who's trying to stop Jesus from being killed and the actual Satan devil wanting Jesus to be killed. There's no contradiction. Yeah, devil diablos. You know? Let me show you now. You see, there's no problem now, right? Is there a problem? If you take the word Satan to mean an opposer, adversary, one who opposes you, anyone and everyone is a Satan to someone. Anyone and everyone is a Satan to someone. And not all Satans are bad. I am a Satan to Satan. You're a Satan to Satan. You oppose him, 
You're adverse to him. You seek to destroy his kingdom and hinder him. You're a good Satan. I'm a good Satan. Jesus, the angel of Jehovah, is a good Satan. Jehovah is a good Satan because Jehovah God Almighty, Father, Holy Spirit, oppose everything that's evil. Everyone who is evil opposes Satan. So God himself is a Satan to evildoers. Exactly. Diabole would be the Greek way of saying it. Do you, you understand that? Who would have thought that Satan has a positive connotation? The angel of Jehovah is a Satan to Balaam, a false prophet, a pervert. The angel of Jehovah is a Satan to all idolaters, whoremongers, homosexuals, lesbians, baby murderers who don't repent. If you don't repent, he's a Satan to them. God is a Satan to evildoers. We who are children of God are a Satan to this world, a Satan to abortion, a Satan to homosexuality, a Satan to transgenderism. We are Satans because we oppose all that's contrary to the will of God, that's evil in the sight of God. You get it now? And Zena, here's the link to John 13, verse 2. Here's the link to John 13, verse 2. You know, go there. You'll see the word devil, diabolu, diabolu. You click on it. Go to Strong's. Okay. And here you'll see the definitions, Zena, for everyone else. Here's the link. Watch here. You click on it. You'll see the definition. Slanderous, accusing falsely. Anyone... Who accuses you, slanders you, is your devil. Don't you say that to someone even now? You stinking devil. You Satan. Right there. Helps word studies. Diabolos. Properly a slanderer. A false accuser. Unjustly criticizing. Unjustly criticizing. Zina, I love to yell at you and put you in your place. Yes, Mohammed. I'm a Satan to Muhammad because Muhammad is a son of Satan, burning in hell under the feet of Jesus, and I'm a good Satan who opposes your filthy, evil Satan, Muhammad. Muhammad, Antichrist, son of Satan. Muhammad ibn Shaytan, who's under the feet of Jesus, burning in hell. Glory to Jesus. Yeah. Satan is a Hebrew word, Michael Panorius. Satan, in Numbers 22, 22, 32, it's Hebrew. Satan. You get it now? Did, did it sink in? Did you now learn not every use of Satan, not every use of devil refers to this evil spirit creature, this evil spirit being? Did you get it? Man, if you got it, you learned something that should now illuminate your reading of the Bible. See you later, CJ. I hope you're blessed. I'm almost done anyway. So when Jesus says to Peter again, get behind me, Satan, was he saying, devil, how'd you enter Peter and inspire Peter to oppose me? Or is he saying, get behind me, you adversary. You, Peter, are now an adversary. You're opposing me and the will of God for me because you're thinking like men. Notice he didn't say that you savor the things of the devil. Because in Matthew 16, 23, it's not Peter filled with the devil. Right? It's Peter being a devil, being an adversary, being an opposer, opposing God's will for Christ. But in the case of Judas, the text is clear. The devil entered Judas. The devil prompt, prompted Judas. The devil, Satan, moved Judas. That's different. Now, Judas is now controlled, possessed, influenced by the devil himself, that evil spirit being. See the difference? Whether it's Greek or Hebrew, J.C. Denton, it's the same point. Okay, so do you understand now 
what Matthew 16, 23 means and doesn't mean. It doesn't mean Peter was filled with the devil like Judas was. It's saying you, Peter, are a human devil. You're a human adversary, a human opposer opposing the will of God, which is why he said, you do not savor the things of God, but of men. Notice he didn't say, you do not savor things of God, but of the devil. So I'm repeating myself more than once until it sinks in that this point becomes crystal clear that you don't misunderstand it. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can now teach others. Right? How many of you were shocked that the angel of Jehovah, who is Jehovah God Almighty, distinct from Jehovah, who is Jesus Christ in his pre existence, was called Satan? Numbers 22, 22. Numbers 22, 32. The angel of Jehovah, and go listen to my previous sessions or read the articles or even watch Anthony Rogers. We show that angel of Jehovah is not a creature. He's the messenger sent by God who is God Almighty, who can do things that only God can do, who later becomes Jesus of Nazareth, so that Jesus there calls himself the, de the devil, Satan. Be caring for Jesus. Clear? Right? So let me repeat, biblically speaking, let this sink in, and I got to finish the final point, the final point on binding and loosing, and that'll be it. I'll, I'll do it. You guys want me to do another Q&A tomorrow, God willing? Live Q&A tomorrow, God willing? Okay. Because this question took the entire two hours. Now, you guys understand why I block people? Because you got demons here, dogs here, who distract and attack. And then people say, that's why your channel doesn't take off. You're so mean. Well, you got blasphemers and people are distracting. What do you want me to do? Just sit there and let them take over? And then dis destroy, destroy for the rest of us? Okay, now, if that is clear, let me repeat this point again. Let me repeat this point again. Everyone is a Satan to someone. Everyone is a Satan to someone. And not all Satans are bad. You can be a good Satan. You can be a good Satan. You, when you oppose Satan, this evil spirit, and his kingdom, and his children, and his agenda, you are a Satan to Satan, and a Satan to his children, and a Satan to this evil world, and a Satan to abortion, and a Satan to homosexuality, and a Satan to transgenderism, and a Satan to all religions, but you're a good Satan because you're opposing that which is evil and abomination to God. God himself, God Almighty, Father, Holy Spirit, is a Satan to the kingdom of darkness, a Satan to this evil world, and a Satan to an agenda. And he is a good Satan, an infinitely good Satan, if you understand what the term means. But that's where being biblically literate, Sargun David, is important. If you're biblically literate, you know the Bible, then you'll understand that the term Satan is not always bad. It's people who don't know the Bible are biblically illiterate that always assume Satan means the evil one, the spirit being the evil one. I know that. They're going to take clips and quote me out of context. I know, Zena. And Satan is, anyway, is that clear? Did you understand this point? George did, Wagner, did you get the answer to your question? Now let me finish the last part of the question. What does it mean for Peter in union with the other apostles will bind what is bound in heaven and loose what is loosed in heaven? So Marcy, I was looking for you. You learn all this, Marcy? You're listening? Because I want to also be a blessing to you, Marcy. Used of God to bless you. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. Let me explain what it means. The apostles, as well as the prophets that worked in union with them, 
the apostles and the prophets that worked in union with them would be given revelation from heaven to tell Christians what they're bound to do. This is what you need to listen to. The apostles and the prophets that worked with them had right the right from God to tell Christians, you're bound to do this, and we're given the right from God to loose us from certain commands. Binding means you're bound to do this. Loose means you're free from doing this. You don't have to do this anymore. Who gives you the right, Peter? Heaven. The triune God gives me the right. You have to do this. Who told you I have to do this, Peter? And by what authority? The authority of Jesus. Jesus gives me the right to say you're bound to do this. You want me there? You understand what binding, loosing means? You have 27 books inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by the apostles or their companions, telling you what you're bound to and what you're loose from. 27 books. Let me give you an example of binding. When Paul says, if you burn with lust, each man should have his wife, each woman her own husband, you're bound to only have sex in marriage. He binds you to only be sexually active in marriage. You don't find a girlfriend and sleep with her. You don't find a boyfriend and sleep with her. And no husband and husband, wife or wife relationships. It's a husband and a wife. And that's the only time you have sex. So you're bound to that. First Corinthians 7 verses 1 to 5. You get my point? He bound you to no premarital sex. And he bound you with the authority of Jesus from heaven, the triumph God from heaven. You only have sex with the opposite member in marriage. Male, female, get married, have all the sex you want. No male and male, no female and female, no transgenders. Someone who's truly born male and gender, born female and gender, get married, have sex, and I bind you to that. Anything else is sin. You get my point? So, you get it now? Now let me give you an example of them loosing you from something. Gentiles, you don't need to circumcise your male sons on the eighth day. You are loosed, freed. Gentiles, you don't have to keep the dietary restrictions of Mo the Mosaic Law in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, except for these things. Loose from that, bound to that. Acts 15, exactly. By what authority, Peter, James, John? By what authority, P Paul, do you say Gentiles are loose from circumcision? The authority of heaven revealing it to us and through us, you're bound to this, loose from that. Acts 15, 28 to 29. Acts 15, 28 to 29. Is that making sense now, Andrew Martin? Acts 15, 28 to 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. See, they're telling you, we are now loosening you from this and binding you from this because the Holy Spirit revealed it to us. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. See, we bind you to that. No meat titles. You're bound to that. And from blood, we bind you to not eat blood. You're bound to that because the Holy Spirit has bound you to that. And the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us and through us, right? <clears throat> and from things strangled, you're bound to that. And from fornication, you're bound to not fornicate. From which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare ye well. So Andrew and everyone else, do you understand what it means for them to bind and loose? They were given the revelation of heaven, the triune God, as the Holy Spirit filled them and revealed these things to them. Bind the Christians to this, loose them from that. Loose them from this, bind them to that. Well, where are all their decisions? That's why you have 27 books of the New Testament. 27 books of the New Testament binding you, loosening you, loosing you. Okay? Final example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. 
First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, and we're done. Medic, don't you dare eat anything with blood in it. You're forbidden by the Holy Spirit. You're bound to not eat blood. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 8. Pay attention to what Paul says. Read this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. By the authority of Jesus Christ, we're exhorting you to this. This is the authority Jesus gives me to exhort you to this. That as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. You have seen from our example instruction how you're supposed to walk in a manner that pleases God. So you would abound more and more. Walk more in that manner. Watch. For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. See, when I told you to do this, that's Jesus commanding me to command you and binding you to these commands. By the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God wants to separate you from the world. So you don't act like the world, talk like the world, think like the world, behave like the world, and condone the things of the world. He separated you from that. Pay attention. This is meat, guys. Understand, this is binding you to commands that the apostles received from the Lord to give to us. That you should abstain from fornication. I'm going to sound like a broken record. Christians born of the Spirit... No sex before marriage. I know it's hard. I know some of us burn. I'm a man too. I burn too. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the authority of Christ, by the blood of Jesus, we mortify the flesh, flesh and say, no, we die to the flesh and to the power of the Holy Spirit. No, we will not have sex before marriage. No, by the blood of Jesus. No, by the Holy Spirit mortifying my flesh. No, because I'm bound not to have Sexual relations until I'm married. Read it. It's a hard message to preach, but we're going to preach it nonetheless. Abstain from fornication, right? That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in sanctification. In sanctification, meaning be separate. Your body, separate your body from the things of the world. Use it to glorify Christ. Use it for purity and holiness, right? Right? Sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concubescence. Not in the lust of your hedonistic fleshly desires. Right? Hedonistic li living, partying. No, none of that. No, none of that. That's not how you use your body. That's not how you use your body in Jesus' name. For hedonism, just passions and partying and lust and gorging. No. As the Gentiles, which know not God. That's how they do it, right? That no man go beyond and defraud his brother. Do not defraud your brother, lie to your brother, cheat your brother. We bind you to this by the authority of heaven. This is bound on earth in any manner. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Now notice what he says here. Verse 8, the warning. He therefore that despiseth, meaning you whoever despised what I just said, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Do you see what he just said? Do you see what he just said? You despise what I just wrote to you, Christians? If you hate what I just said to every one of you, no sex before marriage. So Christians, you got girlfriends, you got boyfriends, you better not be having sex with them. And may the power of the Holy Spirit give us the power to die and mortify the flesh and constrain ourselves and not justify it. Please, Lord, because I'm weak too. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm strong. And you Christians, you're bound not to defraud your brother. Do not cheat him. Do not cheat her. Do not lie to her. Do not lie to him. You're bound. And if you despise what I just wrote, then you despise God. Because this is God binding you to these instructions. And all we're doing is revealing them to you by the spirit that he's given us. You with me there? Hard message, right? Hard message, right? All glory to the triune God. Praise the triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Please give us the power, Holy Spirit. Now to practice these words. 
to obey these words, to live out these words by your power for your glory and have mercy on us. Crucify our flesh. We are weak, burning with lust and passion. We are weak, but you are strong in us. And give us the power to truly obey your words, Holy Spirit, to give, give Jesus the glory, to glorify him, to die to ourselves. Yes to you, Lord Jesus. Yes to your will. Wash us in your blood. Wash our loved ones, our daughters, our, our sons, our family members, my daughters, in your blood, Lord Jesus. Help us to become holier, more in love with you, more pure, more righteous, more worshipful. Please, Lord Jesus, increase in us. Please. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I hope you're blessed. Very intense session. I even felt the intensity because we haven't heard an emphasis. And I know, listen, guys, listen to me. I burn with carnal desires. I'm human, right? That's why I'm asking the Holy Spirit, crucify my flesh, save me from burning, so I can be celibate if that's your will. I understand. But brethren, brothers and sisters, brethren, brothers and sisters, Jesus is worthy that we wrestle with our flesh, struggle with, with burning, fight this, this carnal desire, this lust, and try to conquer it by the power of the Holy Spirit than to succumb and go find a girlfriend, boyfriend, and have sex with them. And live with them outside of marriage. May we never do that. And may Jesus save us. And if we succumb to watching things we don't, Holy Spirit, save us. Purify our minds and our eyes and our <clears throat> electronic devices so we don't succumb. Please, Holy Spirit, help us. You know our weakness. And you know which one of us are weak in those areas. But you are strong in us. Help us, please. Help us. And be patient with us and have mercy on us and forgive us when we fail. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Guys, Lord willing, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll do another live Q&A, God willing. I'll try to do it around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 2 p.m. Canadian Time, New York Time, God willing. Pray for my health to get healthier. More importantly, pray for my daughters to be healthy. Pray for our provision. I need provision to do ministry. I need provision to move in a new place, start a new life. God, save me from this corrupt judicial system. Please pray for that miracle and pray God will make us holier and take us to a higher level of intimacy, of love and holiness, purity, and of wisdom and knowledge in the scriptures. Hope you're blessed. There's a lot of meat today. Very intense and a lot of meat. And Lord willing, in about an hour and 40 minutes, I go live with David Wood on his YouTube channel. Acts 17, in about an hour and 40 minutes. So see you in an hour and 40 minutes, God willing. Christ is risen, risen indeed.